again. And of course, it will hamper efforts to restore power to more than 900,000 homes and businesses in the Northeast. The death toll from the storm rose today to 121. But Sandy could not wipe out Election Day. Jim Axelrod is in Hoboken, New Jersey. Sandy didn't stop me from voting. Nothing would stop Nellie Moyeno from voting. <laughs> Four feet of water swept through her neighborhood in Hoboken last week. At any point did you think, forget it, this year I'm not voting? No. Uh, on the contrary, it, uh, it motivated me to come out. Volunteers scrubbed all weekend to get the polls ready. 800 polling places were without power in New Jersey Saturday. Today, it's fewer than 100. This mobile voting precinct delivered mail-in ballots along the Jersey Shore. On Staten Island, some votes were cast by flashlight. Here to vote! Come on in! New York and New Jersey voters displaced by the storm can vote at any polling place. That contributed to long lines and some confusion. But I thought people were supposed to be able to vote wherever they wanted. Yeah, it's not happening. Okay. But Maureen McDonald was grateful to vote inside this tent in Far Rockaway, New York. Makes me feel proud to be an American that during a disaster like this, we can still vote for our president. Down the street, the National Guard handed out supplies. Roughly 861,000 customers are still without power in New York and New Jersey. The coastal storm due here tomorrow could bring 55 mile per hour wind gusts and heavy snow that could bring down more trees and power lines. To prepare for that storm, Scott, New York's Mayor Bloomberg has issued an order closing all of the city's parks and beaches effective noon tomorrow. Jim, thank you. What are the chances tonight that the Republicans can take control of the Senate? We'll have a look at that coming up next. If you're living with moderate to severe Crohn's disease, Virginia, the four big prizes of the evening, that would still only get him to 266. Then he would have to win one of the remaining five battleground states to get to that number 270. John, thank you. And essentially, the states are given electoral votes as a function of their population. The larger the population of the state, the more electoral votes they have. Anthony Mason is watching our exit polling today. Anthony has been uh, looking at all of the information coming in from the various exit polls. We've been talking to voters, Anthony, as they left the polls in every state all day long. What are you hearing so far? Well, first, Scott, let me give you a sense of where we're going to start here, and that's we're going to be tracking those nine battleground states that you've been talking about. They're going to start out right here in the toss-up column, all nine of them. And as polls close, we're going to look to see whether they begin to lean to a particular candidate. Let's say, for example, Virginia looks like it's leaning to President Obama. That would mean the president has a slight advantage in that state, but that the state could still lean back. The next step would be to move a state over into the likely column. Let's say, for example, that it looks like that North Carolina is a likely win for Governor Romney. That would mean the governor had a clear lead in that state, but that he wasn't quite over the finish line yet. Now, we're going to keep track of these numbers as the night goes on to give you a better sense of how our election desk sees this race unfolding. And of course, we're going to be backing it up with our exit polling data as it comes in, Scott. Anthony, thanks very much. Florida, Ohio, and Virginia are the biggest of the battleground states with a total of 60 electoral votes. We have CBS News correspondents in all three of them tonight. And first, we'll go to our man in Ohio, Dean Reynolds. Dean? Scott, we are noticing something here um, before the polls actually close. Uh, several Board of Elections officials in counties across the state are telling us that provisional voting was very heavy today. Provisional ballots are those which go to people whose registration doesn't necessarily match their address or people who requested an absentee ballot, never filled it out, never sent it back, and then showed up today to vote. So they're given a provisional ballot. Now that's significant because there were 200,000 of those in 2008. It didn't really matter because Barack Obama won Ohio significantly then. But 200,000 votes in a very close race, and those are votes that do not get counted or validated until November 17th. They could be very, very significant in a close race. So that's what we're going to be watching as the evening wears on. Scott? And Ohio could very well be the state tonight that tips the balance for one candidate or the other. Dean, thanks very much. Nancy Cordes is with the Obama campaign at Obama campaign headquarters in Chicago. Nancy? 
Well, Scott, speaking of Ohio, Obama campaign officials continue to insist that it is very unlikely that Governor Romney can overcome their big early voting leads in that state. Beyond that, they're telling me tonight they still think it's very likely that they will pick up three of those battleground states, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Nevada, right off the bat. Just with those four battlegrounds, they get the 270 electoral votes they need to win the presidency. They tell me they're not seeing a big wave for the GOP this time around. They think that the electorate looks more like 2008 when they were swept into power than 2010 when Republicans took control of the House. Do they expect to get the same margins that they did in 2008? No. But they tell me, Scott, they don't need to. Thank you, Nancy. And Jan Crawford has been covering the Romney campaign. She is in Boston tonight. Jan? Well, Scott, Governor Romney just landed here about an hour ago after making campaign stops in that key state of Ohio and in Pennsylvania. He talked to reporters on the way back on the plane, and he said he felt good about this campaign. They hadn't left anything in the locker room, and that he thinks they're going to win. He said he just finished his victory speech. He's not written a concession speech. Now, the mood inside the campaign tonight, Scott, is one of cautious optimism, I'd say, but there is a little bit of nervousness, and here's why. Campaign sources that I'm talking with tonight say they are encouraged by the high numbers of Republican turnout they're seeing in these swing states like Ohio, Florida, Virginia. They believe they will outperform John McCain in 2008. That's the key to this election. They really had to run up the score in those areas. But here's where the nervousness comes in. They're also seeing some of the president's turnout in some of those Democratic areas like in northeastern Ohio near Cleveland, northern Virginia outside of Washington, D.C., and even in Florida outside of Tampa. They're seeing some big turnout numbers there, too. They don't think he can get his 2008 turnout numbers, but Scott, as you know tonight, it's going to be all about turnout. Yes, it will. Jan, thank you very much. The candidate who gets his voters to the polls is likely to win today. Nora, uh, turnout is everything, and the electorate's been changing since 2008. It has, and that's one of the things I'm going to be looking at tonight. Not only how big is the turnout, but also the size of the electorate and how it's made up, the different demographic groups. So we saw, as I pointed out during our evening news, that 26% of the electorate in 2008 was a minority electorate. Does that grow? Does it stay the same or does it shrink? That'll be part of it. The white vote, uh, which was about 73% of the vote, where will that be sort of tonight? It will speak to not only just the changing nature of our country's electorate and the people that are voting, but also perhaps give us some clues about which candidate is doing better. Bob, the national polls over the last few days, dead heat, dead even for both candidates. It's, it's remarkable how evenly split the country is. Well, it really is, but I think we're going to have a big turnout. You heard Jan talking about a big Republican turnout. I think you're going to see a big Democratic turnout. People are interested. We saw that in the debates where you had, um, you know, 60 million people watching uh, each of the debates. Uh, there were good ratings for the uh, uh, primary uh, debates when they were going on. Uh, people are really, really interested. But again, as you say, they are split right down the middle. And everything we've seen from this early wave of, of exit polling uh, just reinforces that. One of the keys tonight is the state of Virginia. The polls have closed in Virginia, but we do not have enough information to make a projection yet. Turnout in Virginia has been very high. Both candidates have been working very hard in Virginia. Anthony Mason has been looking at the exit polling information of what the voters have told us as they left the polls today in that state. Anthony? Yes, yeah, Scott. Of course, four years ago, President Obama won the state of Virginia, but that state has a very red voting history, in fact. In fact, it had gone Republican all the way back to 1964 before the president carried it. One reason he did win it four years ago was independent voters. He won independents narrowly, but he won them 49 to 48 percent. But look what's happening this time around in Virginia among independents. Governor Romney has a clear advantage here, 53 to 41 percent. We asked those independents how they felt about the Obama administration. 50% said they were satisfied, but nearly as many said they were dissatisfied or even angry. So who would do a better job on the economy, we asked, and there Governor Romney had an overwhelming advantage, Scott, 68% to 28%. Virginia is still in the toss-up category, Scott. Anthony, the unemployment rate in Virginia's 5.9% would be the envy of most states in the union. Wyatt Andrews is in Virginia. He's been observing the turnout there. Wyatt, what have you seen? 
Scott, by far the most important trend we saw in Virginia today was extremely high voter turnout. State officials say it will probably be a record. Everywhere we look today, very long lines. In northern Virginia, some voters, state officials say, waited four hours to vote, but they still waited. The Obama campaign has long argued that the high voter turnout here would favor the president because most of the state's 160,000 new registered voters tend to be Latinos, women, and African-American voters inclined to vote for the president. The Romney campaign to that says nonsense, that the high turnout reflects the unprecedented Republican ground game. The Romney campaign also says that it is vastly outperforming the John McCain vote from 2008. We're also hearing from the campaigns tonight, Scott, the Obama camp thrilled with the turnout in Northern Virginia, Norfolk, and Richmond. The Romney campaign very pleased with the turnout in rural areas of the state and western areas of the state. Scott? Virginia critical to both candidates, but really central to the planning of the Romney campaign. Wyatt, thank you so very much. America is not just choosing a president tonight, of course. Control of the Congress is also at stake. And our chief national correspondent, Byron Pitts, is following the House and the Senate races for us tonight. Byron? Well, Scott, you're right. Both parties have plenty at stake tonight in both the Senate and the House. First, the Senate. There are currently 53 Democrats and 47 Republicans. One-third of the U.S. Senate is up for election tonight. That's 33 seats, 23 Democratic and 10 Republican. In order for the Republicans to take control of the Senate, they would need to win four seats. That battle will take place in about a dozen states, from places like Connecticut and Massachusetts out east to Nevada and Arizona out west. CBS News considers six of these states true toss-ups. That's Massachusetts, Connecticut, Virginia, Wisconsin, North Dakota, and Montana. Republicans have what they're calling their Big Four. That's Montana, North Dakota, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. Republicans tell us in order for them to win the Senate, they have to win the majority of the Big Four. The polls have closed. We're going to take a closer look in Virginia where the polls have closed at the Senate race there. There's a contest between two former popular governors. You have Republican George Allen, the former U.S. Senator from that state, and Democrat Tim Kaine, the former head of the Democratic National Committee. This is a very tight race. It's also the most expensive Senate race this year. Now let's take a look at the House of Representatives. As we know, every two years, all 435 seats in the House come up for election. There are currently 242 Republicans, 193 Democrats. In order for Democrats to take control of the House, they would have to win 25 seats. But, Scott, we've talked to a number of Democrats privately who say it's going to be all but impossible for them to get beyond single digits. We will see. Byron, thank you very much. Let's have a look at where things stand at this early moment on election night. This is the presidential race map, the national map. The states that you see in red are the states where CBS News projects Mitt Romney will be victorious. The state that you see in blue there, the state of Vermont, is where we project that President Obama has picked up his first state. The states in white are places where the polls have closed, but we simply do not have enough information yet in order to make a projection. And the states that are in gray are all the places across the country where voters are still at the polls. CBS News coverage of election night will continue in just a moment. but it's worth it. It takes a good teacher to make a great student. <laughs> it takes talent to see talent. New Criminal Minds, Ben. Fractured skull, nose, cheekbone. 